morning's message is entitled Triumph. When the Mardi Gras parade marches down Main Street in Lansdale in the winter, you are sure to see people lined up on the sidewalks with their lawn chairs, just waiting to see the participants in their costumes, their floats, their fire trucks, classic cars, listen to the school bands, and see Santa at the end. Every parade has a purpose as the Mardi Gras in Lansdale welcomes in Christmas. When I lived in Stony Creek, just outside of Reading, we probably had the shortest parade most people have ever seen. The Antietam Valley High School Homecoming Parade consisted of one marching band, the homecoming queen and her court, and two fire trucks. That's it but people still lined the streets to see it. And the band practiced all summer getting ready. When my husband John and I went to Disney World, we noticed hundreds of people lined up on the sidewalks and we were wondering what was going on. We were in a hurry to get to the next ride and the crowd of people was so thick, we had trouble getting through. I asked someone, what is going on? They responded like, I should know. The parade. Okay, now I know. When Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, there were crowds of people in front of him and behind him. They spread their coats and tree branches on the street to make a sort of red carpet. Their voices were lifted in praise, shouting, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. It was a joyous celebration. The Messiah was coming to Jerusalem, riding on a colt, a sign of peace. His entry and the people around him coming through the narrow gate in the city wall created a parade. Many people in the crowd on the sidewalks were wondering what was going on. They asked, who is this? And the people who knew Jesus answered their inquiry saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So we have two crowds of people, some in the know and some not. Some of the people who knew Jesus was traveling with them with, and uh, through the countryside it would be appropriate to expect that they probably saw Jesus performing miracles, healing the sick, and feeding the 5,000 with some loaves and fishes. Many of them probably listened to Jesus as he taught them about the kingdom of heaven. Undoubtedly, there were those in the crowd who, because of what they had watched Jesus do, knew and believed him to be the savior they had been waiting for. And so they shouted, Hosanna, meaning, save us, we beseech thee. But the others, those not in the know, wonder what all the hoopla was about. Which crowd do you identify with? If you were there in Jesus' day, do you think you would have been in the in crowd? In other words, the in the know crowd or the out crowd? In other words, those that were not in the in crowd or in the no crowd. Do you think you would have been sharing the good news or asking what was going on? And which crowd do you identify with today? Are you one who knows who Jesus is and is willing to explain your knowledge of him to others? Or are you one who continues to ask questions about who this Jesus is? Or do you find yourself at times questioning who Jesus is and at other times telling who Jesus is? Where you are on your faith journey will determine what crowd you're in. Most of the Baptist Christians I know would be in the telling who Jesus is crowd. My charismatic and Pentecostal friends can't wait for the opportunity to share Jesus' love with others. But most Reformed Christians I know seem to be in the quieter crowd. 
the conservative crowd, the private crowd, not feeling comfortable about going around telling others about who Jesus is. I think most Reformed Christians aren't comfortable doing this because, well, it's just not practiced. Most mainline Christians don't make a habit of it. It's not comfortable when it's not a regular practice of the church. It's alien when it's not part of our tradition. And it's not a requirement for membership in Protestant denominations. To be a licensed minister in my husband's previous denomination, Church of the Four Square Gospel, the pastor has to account for how many souls they've won to Christ. And if they haven't won any souls to Christ, it is assumed that the person is not an effective minister of the gospel. Being an evangelist is not a requirement of being a Christian, for we all have different gifts to offer. But we need an effective complement of teachers, administrators, prayers, helpers, those with the gift of hospitality, and evangelists to continue to be the church. I thank God that some of our members have come forward to step out of their comfort zone and have shared the invitation of Jesus with those in our community, even if they don't get into a conversation. It's a step in the right direction. God does not call all of us to be evangelists, but if he's calling you, he may have a special mission for you that will directly relate to the growth of our congregation and the church at large. If you are saying yes to the Spirit's urging, you have joined with the group that accompanied Jesus on his journey into Jerusalem. You are part of the in crowd. The Bible tells us that sharing the good news is our responsibility as Christians. We don't have to beat people over the head with the Bible. We don't have to put handcuffs on them and bring them to church. We don't even have to have a lot of scripture memorized and have all the answers. We just need to be invitational, like Jesus. Jesus didn't beat people over the head with scripture. Jesus didn't put shackles on people's hands and feet and make them listen to his sermons. Jesus freed people from bondage. Jesus set people free. I heard a present-day evangelist talking about what's happening in our churches now that the doors are closed because of the COVID-19 crisis. We have to find new ways of being the church together. And one of the possible, possible outcomes will be that people who would otherwise never step in a church building may be hearing the gospel for the very first time. It's up to us to welcome them as brothers and sisters in Christ through love. I think it would be fun to get together someday and practice talking about who Jesus is so that we would feel comfortable telling others. Maybe we could start a reformed tradition. Wouldn't that be great? We could be like Ashley Smith, the lady from Atlanta, Georgia, who was in the news years ago. If you're not familiar with her story, I'll give you some details. She was taken hostage March 12th by the subject of the largest manhunt in Georgia history. The alleged gunman, Brian Nichols, had overpowered an Atlanta courthouse deputy as he was being escorted to court for a rape trial March 11th. He then shot and killed the presiding judge and a court reporter before killing another deputy as he left the courthouse. Later, he killed a federal agent in an attempt to flee authorities. Brian Nichols held Ashley Smith at gunpoint outside her Duluth apartment around 2.30 a.m. March 12th. Apparently having chosen her at random as she returned from a field trip, excuse me, from a trip uh, to a nearby store. Once he removed his hat, she
she recognized him as the man wanted for killing the killing spree and chose to cooperate with his demands. He tied her up and then began to converse with her. Ashley asked Brian not to kill her because she was scheduled to pick up her five-year-old daughter the next morning. Four years prior, her husband had died in her arms after being stabbed in a knife fight. She was concerned that her daughter would become an orphan. She asked the assailant if she could get a book and read to him, and he agreed. She calmed the alleged killer by reading an excerpt from the bestseller book, authored by Rick Warren, The Purpose Driven Life, and talked with him about God. She began reading from where she would have started that day in chapter 33. After she read the first paragraph, the assailant asked her to stop and read it to him again, so she did. She read, we serve God by serving others. The world defines greatness in terms of power, possessions, prestige, and position. If you can demand service from others, you've arrived. In our self-serving culture with its me-first mentality, acting like a servant is not a popular concept." End quote. Nichols held photographs of Smith's family in his hands and said repeatedly that he did not want to hurt anyone else. He asked Ashley if he could stay there a few days and eat some real food and watch some TV and sleep and just do normal things that normal people do. As they continued to talk, Nichols mentioned that he considered his life to be over. He needed hope for his life. He told Ashley that he was already dead. As he engaged in conversation, he said, look at me, look at my eyes. I'm already dead. Ashley responded, you are not dead. You are standing right here in front of me. If you want to die, you can. It's your choice. End quote. Ashley recalls, after I started to read to him, he saw my faith and what I really believed in. And I told him I was a child of God and that I wanted to do God's will. I guess he began to wanted to also. That's what I think, end quote. As time passed during the early morning hours at the apartment, Nichols and Smith talked about God, family, and life experiences, while the fugitive apparently became more comfortable with the hostage. She began to help the gunman consider the families of the victims he had shot and asked if he thought about how they might be feeling. Ashley recalls, after we began to talk, he said he thought I was an angel sent from God and that I was his sister and he was my brother in Christ and that he was lost. And God led him right to me to tell him that he had hurt a lot of people. And the families, the people, to let them know how he felt because he had gone through it himself." End quote. When he was hungry, Smith made him pancakes and they talked more about God she asked him if he believed in miracles, because if he didn't believe in miracles, she said, you are here for a reason. You got out of that courthouse with police everywhere, and you don't think that's a miracle? You don't think you're supposed to be sitting right here in front of me, listening to me tell you your reason for being here? Ashley continued. You know, your miracle could be that you need to be caught for this. You need to go to prison and you need to share the word of God with them, with all the prisoners there." End quote. By 9.30 a.m., Nichols agreed to let Smith leave to pick up her daughter at an Awana children's program her church was having. 
When she reached the first stop sign on her route, Smith dialed 911. And within minutes, a Gwinnett County Police SWAT team had surrounded the apartment with Nichols inside. He waved a white piece of cloth to signal his surrender and was taken into custody. Smith believes God brought him to her door so he couldn't hurt anyone else. Wouldn't it be great to stop crime by sharing the message of Jesus with others? Isn't that great incentive? In the days we're currently facing, Jesus is the way to calm the storm. Many Americans, and I'm sure people around the world, are starting to feel like prisoners in their own homes. In describing our self-quarantine, the government has used the term lockdown, a prison term when inmates are locked down in their cells because of some kind of turmoil within the prison. As I check in with members and friends, some are handling this just fine, while others are letting the stress get to them. Wherever you are on your journey, it's important for us to remember to allow Jesus to quiet our storms. A quote from Project Forgiveness ascertains, when the dust settles, we will probably have a deeper understanding of how little we actually need, how much we truly have, and the extraordinary, extraordinary value of human love and connection, end quote. I know that I can't go through life without Jesus. I know that I can't go through life without worshiping God, who gave me that life in the first place. I'm thankful for the positive things that people are sharing, like spending more time with their family and having dinner together. There are some very creative ways that people are coping like people who live in Italy going out into their balconies and playing instruments. I've played my keyboard for the first time in three years. I've taken online cha-cha and rumba classes with Valentin and Maxim Schmirkowski from Dancing with the Stars and their partners, Jenna and Pita. I'm using the knowledge I have gained from my doctoral research and implementing the integration of technology in the Great Commission. We can celebrate a great victory today, this Palm Sunday. We have learned how to do with less, less eating out in restaurants, less going to the store for groceries. During Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, he learned how to do with less. And on this Palm Sunday, we celebrate his triumphant ride into Jerusalem to continue God's plan of salvation for all who were lost and repentant. Sometimes it seems like we're still lost. We don't always know where to turn for answers. We don't know the why and how and when of this virus. We have to be patient and learn how to wait to return to our normal activities. And I believe somehow when we do, we may just even appreciate them that much more. Jesus triumphed over the grave. He triumphed over oppression. He triumphed over sin. When we walk with him, we can also triumph over our own obstacles like fear, loneliness, isolation, and the need for affirmation. Jesus went to the cross for us. What shall we give him in return? May our God, who gives us voice to speak, Grant us the grace and power to grow in faith, making true the good news of God in Christ every time we speak God's word.
to others. Let us spend more time in this season of waiting, reflecting on our relationship with the Almighty and with others. Let us give to God our hurts, our wants, and our needs in prayer. Let us turn to him and trust him, for he is the way out of this mess.